Well, if you have your Bible with you, and I'm, I'm sure you do, please take it and, t- and turn to Psalm 139, Psalm 139. We're going to look this morning at submitting to God who knows all. And I'm going to begin by reading our passage together, uh, Psalm 139, beginning at verse 1 and reading all the way to verse number 24. And the Word of God says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. Verse 17, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. O that you would slay the wicked, O God! Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed, for they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain." Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. Let's again ask for God's blessing as we uh, go to his word this morning. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you that you indeed know it all. And Father, we just would join with David as he makes that statement, such knowledge is too wonderful for him. It is too high. It is too high for us, O God. And Father, even this morning as we are gathering over Zoom and as I'm preaching in this empty room on Sunday or Saturday evening, Father, we just marvel at your knowledge. There is not a word that we speak that you do not know what its intention was. There is not a thought that we think that you do not know it altogether. There is not a rising or a lying down. There is not a coming nor a going that you do not know. Father, we thank you and we praise you. We worship you this morning, O God. We worship you, O God, that you know it all. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the fact that we cannot escape from your presence that you are with us every single moment of every day. Father, we thank you and we praise you this morning for the great promise of the Lord Jesus to us as he departed to return to glory. Father, that he would never leave us nor forsake us. And Father, this morning we just praise you and we worship you, O God, that you are with us. Be with us now, we pray. Father, we pray that you would speak to us that my words would fall silent at the end of the pulpit, but, Father, your words would speak to every room, every, every heart in every room, Lord. Father, we long for the day that we will be back together together here again 
all of us. Father, we pray that you would sustain us for the, re the remaining part of this awkward journey. Father, we ask you for your help. We bow in submission to your word and to you, O God, and pray that you would speak to us. Search us, O God, this morning through the preaching of the word. Reveal to us, O God, the things in our own hearts that we need to work on, we need to deal with, we need to confess and put right. Father, we ask you for your help, and we give thanks in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't worry, we'll show you the way. So said the very confident young man in his shiny sports car. And so off we went down the road, left turns and right turns, on the freeway and off the freeway. Finally, after what seemed like forever, we were forced to conclude that he had absolutely no idea where he was going. He was as lost as we were. He had no idea how to get us to our destination. And we decided to part company. No amount of persuasive pleading on his part would induce us to trust him and submit to his leadership to get us to our destination. Our trust in that young man was a disappointing failure. On a more serious note, we trust doctors as they prescribe strange and usually sour-tasting uh, medication. Their assurance is that it will provide the cure if properly taken. Doctors have medical degrees and certification. We trust doctors that the questions they've asked, the examinations they've carried out, and the tests that they've called for will give them the required necessary knowledge for them to prescribe to us the strange and sour medicine that will resolve our medical problem. We trust that they have the necessary knowledge, understanding, and skill at their profession to lead us in the right course of action. Well, let me ask you this morning, let us ask all of us, do you trust God as much as you trust your doctor? God often prescribes unpleasant, uncomfortable paths to follow. God puts us through difficult and often painful sets of circumstances, knowing that it is for our good and His glory. So do you trust God as quickly as you trust your doctor? In our psalm this morning, our text, David was living in a difficult set of circumstances. We can see from verses 19 and 20 of Psalm 139 that he was surrounded by wicked and ungodly men of bloodshed. As David was writing the psalm, these men were still speaking against God, taking God's name in vain. David, as part of his prayer psalm, was calling on God to slay them and remove them, which God had still not yet done. But David was trusting in the Lord. As the psalm displays, in the psalm, David declared his loyalty to God, his submission to God, and he gives us his grounds or his reasons to submit and trust in God. Preaching, a message, is not a ministry for information. It is, as Brian Chappelle writes, a ministry of transformation. Why do we sit and listen to preaching? To understand all the intricate theology of the Bible, yes, that is a good thing. But we listen to preaching primarily that, the, that we might be transformed, that through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, we might be conformed to the image of Christ. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3.16 and 2 Peter 1.21 that the Holy Spirit has inspired all Scripture and declared it profitable, useful for teaching, for gentle rebuke, 
for correction and for training in righteousness. God the Holy Spirit has given us David's prayer in Psalm 139 to teach us why we must submit to God and trust in Him. And we submit to God for three reasons, which we'll see from the text. And they're right there in front of you. You can see them as clearly as I can. Number one, God knows us. Number two, God is with us. And number three, God created us. So first of all, we submit to God who knows us. Notice in the first six verses, here the Spirit of God is teaching us that God is all-knowing. He knows everything past, present, future, possible, and actual. In verse 4, David says, Behold, O Lord, you know it all, everything. There is no limit or restraint to God's knowledge. God knows us personally and intimately. In verse 1, God has searched and known us. He's investigated us. He's explored. He knows every single detail about you. As Jesus would say in the New Testament, the very hairs on your head are even numbered. For some of us, there's a higher number, and for some, there's a lesser number. But everyone is numbered. In verse 2, the Bible tells us of Psalm 139 that He knows the full scope of our actions, whether we sit or whether we rise. And David's using a literary device to explain the two extreme possibilities of his action, whether he's sitting down or rising up, whatever his action may, from, may be from complete rest to greatly active, God knows it all. In verse 3, he understands our thoughts, our reasoning, our purposes. You and I cannot deceive God by saying, I didn't mean it like that, because he knows. In verse 3, God scrutinizes my path, my journeying, and my lying down. And the idea there is, he knows our direction our plans and our purposes, the, the work that we do, and as we travel for work and we go this way and that way, He knows what our direction, our course of life is. God knows it all. In the second half of verse 3, the Bible says that God is intimately acquainted with all my ways. He knows our behavior. He knows the way we conduct ourselves. If you're a thief you'll not hide it from God. You might hide it from others, perhaps, but not from God. If you're a liar, you will not hide it from God. If you're an adulterer, you will not hide it from God. If you're given to uncontrolled, angry outbursts, God knows. If you're living a double life, a hypocritical life, one for the Christian friends and one for the world, you will not hide that from God. You might hide it from each group of friends for a time, but inevitably, they will find out. God knows it all. Consider the example of those who tried to hide from God in Scripture. Adam and Eve tried to hide their sin behind the leaves, the garments they made for themselves, but God knew, and at precisely the right time, God arrived. Jacob's sons tried to hide their sin of selling Joseph into slavery, but God knew, and in the end, they were all found out. David tried to hide his sin with Bathsheba, plotting and scheming and planning, lying, murder, adultery, but God saw and God knew. In the end, God confronted David with his sin. God knows all our ways. But then again, on a positive note, God also knows the ways of faithfulness of the godly. He knows those who are living in faithful submission to God. He sees and He knows. If you're a prayer warrior wearing holes in your closet floor with your knees, the Lord sees and the Lord knows. If you're a faithful witness for the Lord, God knows. God is intimately acquainted with all, all our ways and conducts. 
In verse 4, we see that God knows our intentions. Even before there's a word on our tongue, God knows what we intend to say. He knows it all. God discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We may fool everybody else with our spiritual sounding words and recounted actions, but God sees the heart and God knows it all. But praise the Lord. God also knows us with His own purposes in mind. God's knowledge of us is not merely information. God's knowledge here includes His determination to know us intimately and savingly. In verse 5, the Bible says that God has enclosed or surrounded or boxed us in. It has the idea of both protection and laying a siege against. It has the idea of hemming us in to bring us to submit in surrender to God who is an authority over us all as the one true God. In verse 5, God has surrounded us to lay His hand upon us. That phrase means to set us in the place of blessing. If you use a New Living Translation, you have a phrase like that in there. This, in verse 5, is God's electing knowledge of us. God knows us to save us. So why should we submit to God and trust in Him? The very simple answer, that God knows us. You say, what does submission to God entail? Several things. We submit, first of all, on God's terms, not our own. This is an absolute surrender. We confess our sin and disobedience to God. He knows it all. We seek His forgiveness for those sins He already knows about. We follow His leading, living in obedience to Him, and we'll see that in verse 24. We pray and we seek the wisdom and guidance of God. Submission involves confession, seeking forgiveness, following Him, praying and seeking His wisdom and His guidance. God knows it all. Who better to ask than God? From living according to our own knowledge and thinking to following His Word, His will, and His ways. In verse 17, we see that David treasured God's thoughts. God's words, God's thinking was highly valuable to him. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. In other words, David valued what God thought. We pray and seek the wisdom of God. We treasure His word and His will. We trust Him who knows it all, that He is leading us along His path of righteousness to bring us to His heavenly city in His time. We trust God that He knows what He is doing, even when our circumstances are beyond belief or explanation. Remember verses 19 and 20? David is still surrounded by wicked men. David is still surrounded by men of bloodshed. You can hear the cry of his heart, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. And he, he expresses how they speak against God. They take his name in vain. And, God, and David hates those who hate God. David's loyalty is with God. We trust God when the circumstances are beyond our belief and explanation. You know, God does not always give an answer. We, we don't see from the text that David had an answer why those wicked men were surrounding him still. But we understand this, that even when we cannot understand or explain our circumstances, and they seem to take our breath away, and we find ourselves asking, why is this happening to me? We can go back to the same thought. God knows it all. God is working for our good and His glory. We submit to Him and trust Him because He knows it all. We respond in praise. Like David who says in verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. God's knowledge is too high for me. That's an expression of praise. He's bowing and saying, I just can't un I cannot comprehend the greatness of the knowledge of God. 
we submit to him as we confess our sin. We seek his forgiveness. We follow his leading. They all require submission. We pray and seek his wisdom in submission. We trust him in submission to him. Listen, the refusal to trust God is rebellion against God. And belief in God is submission to God. We come in submission to him. Our second heading this morning is this. We submit to God who is always with us. Notice the second stanza of the psalm, verses 7 to verse 12. David declares and sings the praises of God who is always everywhere present with us. He says twice there, and a third time it's implied, you are there. Perhaps David thought of Bathsheba, that affair. Perhaps David's thoughts went back to Psalm 32 as he was writing Psalm 139. And perhaps as he wrestled, he had mused, it's pointless. Where can I possibly go to flee from God's presence? Isn't it interesting that we have a desire for God's presence when we are walking in obedience and walking in submission? But as soon as things change and we begin to walk in rebellion, we begin to walk in a refusal to trust God. We have no desire for God's presence. Why is it so easy to absent ourselves from church? Obviously, right now is not a, a good way to think of this, but remember those days when we were all gathering here. Was your desire to be with God's people? Was your desire to be together? Did you want to be in the presence of the living God? Was that your first thought and your first desire? David says here, where can I go? Where can I flee from your presence? Now you could argue that he's speaking about intimacy of God, that he doesn't want to get away. And that's entirely possible. But I think it's also entirely possible that it was a moment in his life when he wanted to get away. And I know from my own life, when sin creeps in, and things between me and the Lord become strained because I'm living in rebellion against God. I, have, I lose quickly the desire for God's people. I lose quickly the desire for God's presence. David says in verse 8, If I could ascend to heaven, you're there. If I could make my bed in Sheol, verse 9, God is there. And once again, David's using a literary device to explain the two extreme opposites, the heights of heaven or the depths of Sheol. Either way, if I go there, you're there. David says in verse 9, if I could take the wings of the dawn. David means if I could catch a ride on a beam of light at the very first crack of dawn, riding as it traveled across the sky at 299,000 kilometers a second, he still could not escape from God because God is always present everywhere. You cannot escape from God. He knows where you are. And listen, the faster and further that we run from God, we run right into Him. If we travel from the furthest of the east to the furthest of the west, as on the wings of the dawn, there is still no escape from God's presence. Maybe what about hiding in the depths of the sea? Look what he says in verse number uh, 9 again. The challenger deep is the deepest spot they've found. 36,200 feet deep. That's a long way down. 11 kilometers. And David says, even there, God's hand will lead him. Even from there, God's right hand will lay hold upon him. Neither David nor we can escape from the omnipresent God. Remember Jonah? He did not want to obey God's command, so he ran away from God. Did you notice? He went down to Joppa. He went down into the depths of the ship, and from there he went down into the depths of the ocean. At the bottom, inside the belly of a whale, God met with him. God could have met him on the road, could have met him on the dock, could have met him on the deck of the ship. But God often waits until we can go no further before He comes and meets with us. 
He reveals Himself to us. He speaks to us. Listen, God is always present everywhere. You cannot escape. Maybe you're trying to escape from God's convicting voice. Maybe you've entangled yourself in a relationship that does not please God. Maybe you've slipped into a disobedient habit or lifestyle. Or maybe you've committed some sin and you're desperately trying to hide it, desperate that the evidence not be found and made known. Maybe there's a sinful habit that at first you just dabbled a little in, only to discover that it had hooks of its own. And now it's got a hold on you and you cannot get, let it go. I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit inspired this psalm as David expressed his own thoughts recorded in Holy Scripture to teach us we cannot ever escape from God who is omnipresent. Maybe you've heard the gospel message. You've heard it and you're resisting it. You understand that God is absolutely holy, that you are a sinner. You've disobeyed God's word. You understand that the penalty for that sin is death. You know, you know that God has given His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be the Savior of the world, to die in your place, to pay the penalty for your sin. You know, you've already heard it. I cannot, I don't have to tell you again that by believing in Him and turning away from sin to walk with God by faith and obedience, you will have forgiveness. You will have the positive side of verses 7 to 12 that you cannot go away from God. He will always be with you. You and I cannot escape from God. So how then do we live with God from whom we cannot hide We submit to God for our salvation. As I said before, disbelief equals rebellion. We will not believe and we will not submit. But belief is fundamentally submission. We bow our wills, our hearts, and our lives to God. It is not a moment. It's a lifetime. And brothers and sisters, some of us have been living and walking with the Lord for 20 and 30 years, and we are still wrestling with submission. And God will lay his hand on us, and as a faithful father, he will continue to discipline us, to bring us to that submission, that full submission to God. But as believers submitting to God, think of the great hope that we have. Think of this assurance Where can I flee from your presence? You are with me. Where can I go from your spirit? You're with me. Even David, surrounded by ungodly men, is declaring with great emphasis in verses 19 to 22 his loyalty to God. Christian, fear not, for the Lord thy God is with you. He's with you in the doctor's office. He's with you in the critic's den. And that can be a very nasty place to spend time. The great tragedy is that some Christians have sharpened their teeth against others, and the critic's den can be a horrible place to spend time. But I assure you, God is with you. He's with you in the cancer ward. He's with you in the funeral parlor. He's with you when everybody else abandons you and you feel absolutely alone. He's with you in through the gnawing ache of loneliness. He's with you whether the bank account is full or empty. His right hand will never cease to lead you. He's with you when our understanding ceases. We live with the God who is always present everywhere by submitting ourselves to God in faith and obedience. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Praise God for such a truth. So first of all, we submit to God who knows us. We we submit to God who is with us. And thirdly, we submit to God who created us. Notice verses 13 to 16. God made us. He knows us. He's always with us. He made us. 
In verse 16, he saw our unformed substance. And the idea there is that God knew us in eternity past. Before he had even spoken creation into existence, he knew the number of the hairs on your head today. In verse 16, it's a wonderful truth. God ordained all our days. He knew the days of our, the day of our conception and the day of your birth. He knew the days of your growth through child and teenager and early adulthood. He knew the days of your studies at school and uni and on the apprenticeship program. He knew our loves and our weddings. He knew the days of our retirement. And he even knows the day of our death. All those days were ordained by God for us. I was uh, recounting to the Bible study, I think it was last Wednesday night, about Stonewall Jackson. Stonewall Jackson was a, a Confederate Army general in the American Civil War. In the middle of the battle, as the bullets are whipping around his head, he's sitting on his horse, a great big tall man on a big horse, calm as and collected, issuing orders, driving, uh, steering the battle, accomplishing a great victory for the Confederate army. After the battle, he and one of his aides are walking through the battlefield, and there's the dead and dying are all over the place. And he's broken and weeping over those that are lost. And his aide turns to him and says, Sir, how is it? How, how do you do it? How do you sit on your horse in the middle of a battle with the bullets whizzing all around your head? as calm as can be. I can't quote the exact words, but the thoughts that he expressed were something like this. God has fixed the day of my death. I cannot change that. The key is to be ready to die, whether it be today or in 20 years. That's obviously not the, the exact words, but that was the sentiment that he expressed Brothers and sisters, we submit to God who has ordained all our days when as yet there was not even one of them. If you notice, he commits them in writing. In your book, they were written down. God has your life perfectly ordered and laid out. God has even set those ordained days down in writing. In verse 15, God made you. He skillfully wrought you like a blacksmith who pounds on the hot iron with a hammer, bending, flattening, shaping, and forming what he designed you to be. In verse 13, he formed your inward parts. In verse 13b, he wove you together like a beautiful, intricate tapestry. That's amazing. That's the wording that the David is using there. Listen, make no mistake whatsoever, the split second of your conception, when God imparted a spirit to your physical body, you became a human being created in God's image for His glory. And if I can take a moment for one quick aside, the word abortion is so cold and clinical and wrong. It is murder. To take the life of a child in the womb is murder as surely as it is murder to walk up to another human being outside the womb and cave in their skulls with a sledgehammer. It's still murder. It's tragic that our nation, amongst so many other nations around the world, is contemplating full-term abortion. Abortion is murder at any moment. Listen, God in wonderful master craftsmanship wove you together. God did not make any mistakes. Even when some are born different to the majority, He has a purpose for all our lives, whatever the differences may be. Whether it's Down syndrome or autism or blindness or disease, it's not a defect. It is as God designed it. God who ordained your life set you as immortal until all His purposes and plans for your life are accomplished. But listen, 
God did not create you nor design you to exist in a sort of prison cell of His predetermined will. Absolutely not. He designed you and predestined you knowing what your passions, your loves, your talents, your abilities would and could be, especially in the experience of His saving grace. God designed you with them to live out His ordained design for your life, knowing the heights of joy and fulfillment and satisfaction. God designed it such that as we live by faith in Him and obedient submission to Him and His Word, we would know the joy of living for His glory. God created you, and by our daily yielding ourselves to Him, to use us like sharpened tools, we will know in joy and obedience, we will know, sorry, joy in the obedience to His will and His Word. Brothers and sisters, God knows it all. God is, knows us to the extent that He is always everywhere, present with us all the time. God knows you intimately. He formed you and wove you in the womb as He created you. And there's so much more that I want to say. There's so many other things that we could draw out of this text. But we need to wrap it up. How did David respond? Well, we see very clearly that David responded in submission. But how? In fact, what did that submission open up for David? It isn't just a groveling down, a submission where he walked around going and cringing and, and, and fearing the next blow to come from somewhere. No, a life of submission is a life of joyful obedience to God. We can see from verse 6 that David lived a life of praising God. He praised God's knowledge. If, if you have a... a NIV version, and verse 14, it says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. David lived in praise of God and God's knowledge. He lived in thanksgiving, in verse 14, for God's creation of him. Listen, go back to the praise section for a moment. Because David had submitted himself to God, he also lived in worship of God. You can't have one without the other. You cannot truly worship God that you are not living in submission to. When church resumes and we rock up here together on Sunday morning and you come knowing that there is sin in your life, you come into this place knowing that the things are not right between you and God. You might be able to sing some hymns. You might be able to offer a prayer or close your eyes and listen as a prayer is offered, but you will not be able to worship. Worship requires submission. In verse 17, we see that David lived treasuring God's words, God's thoughts, Knowing that God knew all things, he treasured God's thoughts. Knowing God's creation, he treasured God's thoughts. Knowing that God had ordained all the days of his life, he treasured God's thoughts and God's words. And brother and sister, let me ask you, do you treasure? Do you value of the highest level God's thoughts expressed to you all Scripture is given by the breathing out of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's why we have it. Do we treasure God's thoughts? Do we value Him and His Word above all? And there's one other one I'm going to add in here. It's not, maybe not on your note sheet. In verses 21 and 22, David declared openly his absolute loyalty and commitment to God. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? 
Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. Now we realize that David was living in a different time. And we come now with a determination to love our enemies, not to agree with what they do, not to condone what they do, but to preach the gospel, to declare before them that God is holy and God will require an accounting, to declare to them what God has done, to see them also submit. But it begins by declaring our loyalty to God, declaring openly our commitment to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Finally, submission to God's continual knowing, testing, and leading. That's what it involves. It's continual submission. Go to verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God. That's a prayer. Did you notice? I'm sure you did. As you start off the psalm in verse 1, Lord, you have searched me and known me. Past tense. You know when I sit down and when I rise, past tense. You understand, you scrutinize, and so on. Then he goes to verse 23, and he begins to unfold the same sentiments and thoughts again, only now they are submitted as imperative verbs where he is pleading for God to do something. Lord, search me. Submission is ongoing. Lord, search me and know my heart. Try me, test me, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is in me a hurtful way and lead me in the everlasting way. That's submission. A submission to God, crying out for God to examine us, to test us, and to lead us. If we are being led we must submit to the leadership and follow where God takes us. Brother and sister in Christ, this morning as we wrap up and our time is is fast going away, how is it with you and God? Are you living in submission to the living God? Are you living in submission knowing that He knows it all? If you don't know that, let me remind you again, God knows you in every detail. You cannot hide from Him. Are you submitting to God knowing that He is with you? Christian, everywhere you go, the Spirit of God goes with you. You cannot hide from God. You cannot escape from God. From the depths of the deepest part of the ocean, from the depths of hell, to the heights of glory in heaven, God is there. As far as the east is from the west, in a straight line, God is there. You cannot hide and you cannot escape. God made you. Christian, whatever you're going through, what struggle you have, maybe some of you are struggling because you feel that the way God made you is unfair. Other people have advantages that you don't have. Listen, God does not make junk. He made you, He designed you, He formed you, He fashioned you exactly according to His plan. And in submission to Him, you will know the joy of those things that He has blessed you with. Even if the blessing is a difficulty, is a lifelong restraint. Trust God, submit to Him, and know the joy of walking by faith with a God that you are always close to. Loving Father, as we, we close the service, and we thank You, O God, for a good day of worship. Father, we look forward to, the, to Sunday afternoon and seeing a woman who has come in faith and in submission to You is following that step of obedience and submitting to the, the, ro- the right, the, the calling to be, be, to be baptized. Father, that is the first step of submission and obedience for every child of God. Father, we pray for Suzanne that you would strengthen her and encourage her. Bless her greatly, O oh God, as she follows you and obeys you. Father, we give thanks for our time in the Word, and we pray, O God, that the Spirit of God would teach us the Word, 
would drive home the thoughts of this psalm. Father, if these frail human lips have said something they should not have said, wipe it, O God, I pray, from our memories that we would hear only your voice. Father, we ask you for your help and we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.